out of Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted with the train of the, his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each taking six wings. Two covered his face, two covered his feet, and two he flew. And the one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundation of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called, called out while the temple was filling with smoke. And then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with a tongue. And he touched my mouth, and he said, and behold, this has touched your lips, and iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, send me. Send me. Father God, I come before you. And I want to thank you for the things you're showing me about myself and who you are. I thank you, God, that you said You want us to know you so intimately. I confess to you, Lord, that I can't give this word. We can't hear this word. Holy Spirit, you must. You must, if anything's to be done, is to work through my mouth, my heart, my mind, and work through all of our ears to move into our heart. Only you can do that, Lord. Oh God, we got a world so filled with hurt and pain. And the only hope is you. And the hope is your people failing before you praying. So, Father God, I thank you. In Jesus' name. So we say together, I'm emphatically in love with my right position in God and radically pursue it. This morning we're going to pursue this deeper. And the theme this morning is, who are you? Who am I? Chris called me this past week and asked if I'd be available for a funeral. The man had taken his life. And I just felt so bad because this guy didn't know who he was. Totally lost. Totally oblivious to anything of any identity. That because he was so filled with hopelessness, he thought the best thing to do is take his life. When you think about America today, there's, 
We have an identity crisis. We don't know who we are. Girls are becoming boys and boys are becoming girls. Are you kidding me? Just look south. It's very simple what you are. And now we're making this, you can be whoever you want to be. No. Identity. This isn't a political issue, but the United States we had an identity. But now we've let over a million immigrants, they've snuck over this past year. I mean, we're losing our identity. Instead of having individual nations, we want a one world order. We've lost our identity. And so the question becomes, what's your identity? How do you establish your identity? What makes you what you are? And that's a great question. You know what the world says? I looked up this one website. This is what they did. Get to know yourself. You got to know your favorite colors and your ice cream flavor. And what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite flower? What well, list the smells that you enjoy? Oh, I enjoy going to Chick-fil-A in the morning. I enjoy... The different smells that we can have. Identity is that the warm cookies cooking, the freshly cut grass. What are the list of books you love to read or you want to read in the future? That'll be your identity. What are your political views? That's your identity. Your career choices, your hobbies, that becomes your identity. What about your body? Do you feel happy? Are you sad? Or are you tensed? Are you relaxed? What's your idea? That'll help form your identity. Here to say that's hogwash. Here's how we get our identity. First text we're going to look at is Exodus 3. In Exodus 3, we see that Moses had now been in the Midian for 40 years. He'd been out of Egypt. And as he was out shepherding, he saw this burning bush, and he goes up to the burning bush and draws him to him. And he heard, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. And so God begins to tell him that he's heard the affliction of the people and his people, and he wanted him to go down to Egypt to set the people free. And here's Moses' question. He asked the question that we need to all ask. Who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I? that I should bring the sons of Egypt, Israel, out, for, out of Egypt. And the Lord said this, Certainly I will be with you. You see, Moses was looking at his identity. He said he's recognized he's about 80 years of age. That's my identity. I, I was used to be in Egypt. I was raised by the Pharaoh's daughter. I had been grown and... My, she, I was born a Jewish Israelite. They were killing all the young bale boy babies. My mother put me in a little raft, sent me down the river. As he went down the river, Pharaoh's daughter saw the little raft, saw it was a little baby. It was me. He said, how cute. I think I'll raise this baby. My sister happened to be watching this whole thing go on and says, I can get you a Jewish woman to help raise this baby. Happened to be she got my mother. So my mother identified, it told me that I was a Jewish young man and I had all the rootedness of Abraham and Joseph and Isaac and all the boys. And now, because I love the Jewish people, 40 years ago, I was out there with the Israelite people and the, as they were doing in slave labor, and they were much slave labor, and I saw one of the Egyptians treat one of my brothers, Israelite brothers, mean. And so I went and I killed him. I hid him. I didn't think anybody saw. But I found out everybody saw, including the Pharaoh. So I skedaddled. And because I skedaddled, I went down to Midianite. And there I got married. I had a couple kids. So things were good. And now you, God, are telling me to go back? Who am I to go back? I'm going to get killed. Here's his identity. I am with you. That's his identity. I am with you. That's the identity. Judges. In the book of Judges, chapter 6, 
We see that the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of God. We see all kinds of things going on. God had brought them out of slavery, but now he had the Midianites come in. And as the Midianites came in, they were like swarms of locusts. They were literally taking all the Israelites' cattle, all of their horses, everything they had, their livestock. They, when the Israelites put crops into the field, they would come and they would take it all. So the Israelites were absolutely desperate. De- desperate. In fact, they were living in the caves. You can imagine that with yourself. So you had nothing. You had nothing. And there is, there's old Gideon, and he's under this oak tree, mommy, trying to hide some as he's thrashing some, some wheat. And so as he's doing this, an angel comes up to him, and he says these words, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Say that with me. The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. See, the Lord has given Gideon an identity. His identity is, I'm, the Lord is with you. I am with you. That's your identity. And because the Lord is with you, you're now a valiant warrior. You will never be a valiant warrior unless the Lord is with you, right? So that's what he's saying here. So what does Gideon do? Well, Gideon does what everybody does. Complains. (laughs) Oh, no, I'm not that. I'm not that. In fact, he begins asking questions to God. He says, he begins to complain against God. He says, my Lord, if the Lord's with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the miracles that happened with my father? Why did, did not the God bring us out of Egypt? Now the Lord has abandoned us. I mean, he's making all kinds of excuses. No, the Lord's not with me. You ever think the Lord's not with you? Let's be honest. We do, don't we? Sometimes we feel abandoned. Sometimes we think we're by ourselves. We, sometimes we think we got nothing going for us. And we make all the excuses. Why, 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 why? Maybe it's our sickness. Maybe it's a death. Maybe it's, it's somebody going on in our life. Maybe it's our employment. Maybe it's our financial situation. Whatever. You name it. And what did the Lord do? It says the Lord looked at him and he says, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? What's the strength? The strength is the Lord's with you. The Lord is with you. When you go to work, the Lord is with you. When you go to the funeral, the Lord's with you. When you go to see Kelly's family today, you're going with the strength. The Lord is with you. Your identity, who you are. When you gals go to Chick-fil-A to work, you're going with identity. This is who you are. The Lord is with you. We'll say that wasn't good enough. He goes, oh Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Then he comes up with excuses why he is, can't do this. Behold, my family is the least of Manasseh, and I'm the youngest in my family's house, my father's house. Have you ever come up with excuses why you can't do something? <laughs> All the time, don't we? I can't do this. I can't go to study. I can't read. I can't do this. I'm too busy. Dr. And we make all excuses why we can't be followers of Christ and really be all that God wants us to be. We do that. So, but what is And he does the same thing. Here's his excuse. Manassas was the smallest number of armed men. In, you got it in Numbers 2. They list all the 12 tribes. Manassas was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And they listed all the 12 tribes. You know who had the least of all men? Manassas. They were the youngest of youngest. That means of the totem pole of the greatness of the list of all the tribes, Manassas was at the very bottom. All right? And then, of the 3,200 men that were in Manassas, the war valiant warriors, Gideon's family have a chart of 32,000. Boom! You're at the bottom. Okay? Then, of his family, you go through the chart. Mom, dad, brother, 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 me. Do you ever feel that insignificant? I mean, this guy was the insignificant of all insignificant. This guy had nothing going for him according to the world. He was the least of the least. May I, we might, people might say that about our little body. There's only 15 or so here today. 14, 15. You can't do anything. You don't got nothing. What does the Lord say? He said, 
I'm with you. He said, surely I will be with you. Surely I will be with you. Say that with me. Surely I will be with you. You know what he did next? He went into town. He had, he had, he had to have a show, a sign. God showed him a sign, okay. And then he went into town. And when he went into town at night, he had to tear down the Baal worship. That's a false god. Now I'm going to tell you something, folks, guys. I mean, this is a little secret. It's not a real secret, but it's a good secret. You and I will not grow until we tear down the Baals of our life. The false gods we put in our life. Things that we put above God. Amen? And you think about the things that we may put above God. Okay, you know what they are. I know what they are in my life. But you've got to go battle spiritual warfare. That's exactly what's going on. You've got to battle that stuff. And you've got to tear them down. And you've got to tear them down. They say, in the name of Jesus, take away my, my selfishness. In the name of Jesus, God, I come against that anger that I have. I come against it. As the more you tear down that wall, tear down that wall, God's going to use you. And we found that God did use Midian because he took 300 men and conquered this whole nation. 300 men. How do you do that? Only God but he had to tear down the walls. He had to tear down the walls. So what's in your walls that need to be torn down? What are things? Do you worry? Are, are some of you the queen and king of worry? Are some of us, you know, you know the list. I don't have to tell you. Tear them down. Go to God and say, God, in the name of Jesus, I tear this down. I give it to you because I don't want to have it anymore because you don't want me to have it. Okay? Make sense? Okay. It all starts there. It all starts there. All right, let's move on. Before you can do that, see, what I liked about Gideon is Gideon was honest where he was. I can't tell. You've got to be honest with where you are. How many times? You doing okay, Carl? Yeah, I'm fine. And deep down deep, this rage going on. Okay? And that's how we are with God. We don't tell God about what's going on in our spirit. God, I'm angry today. I'm anxious today. We start a prayer today, uh, the three of us up here. I mean, I had to repent because I was ticked off about some things. But I had to give it to God. I had to give it to God. I had to give it to God. And tell Him how I was really feeling. And what I'm going on in my life. And to hear Him give the special signs of wonders and just tell me He loves me. All right, let's move on. You know, most people lie about their identity. Do you know that? We lie about our identity all the time. And we see it all around us. And we see Joshua gave a perfect example. I really appreciate this story in Joshua because you've got to understand, they just came over the, the, the uh, they just defeated Jericho. And the, the, the word on the street was, these people got God on their side. There's no way we can make this work. We're going to get defeated by them. So Gibeonites wanted to save themselves. And they wanted to fit in so that they wouldn't get killed by the, by the Israelites. And so what did they do? They said, we need to act differently. We need to come and we need to go ahead and we need to go to the Israelites and make a covenant with them. But if we make a covenant with them as though we're neighbors, they're going to kill us. But if we do this, if we act like we're foreigners... We can come in and pretend we're something we are not. Have you ever pretended you're something that you are not? Yeah, we, we all do, don't we, Robin? We've all done that. We've all acted differently. Remember when we were kids, we'd wear clothes to get attention? <sighs> we did, didn't we? We acted a certain way to get some attention. We had a certain haircut because everybody else was doing it. Okay? We all done it. And we still might do it. I'm going to drive this because it looks good. People are going to recognize me. Okay, we've all done it. We've all been there. Because we want to fit in. But it's not who we really are. But we're acting like it's something we are. And so they did the same thing. So what they did is they, they acted craftily. And they brought this envoy. And they took worn out sacks on their donkeys. 
Instead of taking the new ones, they took the worn out ones. They took patched shoes and sandals. They put out worn out holy clothes. Though that could be a style for today, isn't it? <sighs> I'm a man. No, I won't go there. But anyway, <sighs> they took dry crumbled bread for provision. And they crumbled, looking like they'd been on a long, long journey. And they came before them looking weak and sad. And they said, oh, we were came and we wanted your help. We want to make this covenant with you. Because Joshua had asked, who are you? And they told him nothing but a lie. How many times do we lie to God about who we are? How many times do we lie to others who we are? How many times we're not honest and straightforward? Because that's what God wants us to be. Because when we're lying to ourselves, we're lying to God. We need to be absolutely transparent. God may want us to do A, B, and C, and I say, no. And we've got to say, I can't, I can't. How many times we say, I can't? But yes, we really can, but we're making excuses why I can't. I've done it, you've done it, we all do it. And it's time God says, get rid of it. Know who you are. Know who you are. See, Jesus knew who he was. Love about Jesus. Jesus knew who he was. I love Jesus. He didn't hide anything, you know? He said, it was so cool. And I'm going to have to go back to the Old Testament. Most of us live a lie who we are. We're not transparent and honest. But I'm asking God to help me to be more transparent. Help me to be so honest with Him so I can be honest with others. But Jesus knew who He was. And if you go back to the Old Testament, God says about Himself, He says, I, even I, am He who comforts you. He says, I am. That's who God says I am. He is. In Isaiah 43, he said, he's speaking. He says, you are my witnesses and you are my servants whom I've chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. In verse 13, even from eternity, I am He. What's God's name? Say it again. I am He. Say that with you one more time. God's name is I am He. So Jesus, we see in John, He's been in front of these Pharisees. They're having this dialogue. Jesus is testifying who He is. He says, I, I am he who testifies about myself. And the Father sent me, testifies about me. He's making it very clear, I'm from the Father. He goes on then. He talks about he's going to have to die. And he says, they ask, where are you going? You cannot, he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. And Jesus says to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I'm not of this world. I'm, he's identifying who he is. He goes on in verse 25. So they were saying to him, Who are you? That's a great question. And Jesus knew who he was. He knew that he was from above. They were from below. He goes on to say, after they asked that question, he knew he was the Son of Man. He knew that it, what he knew the Father sent him. He knew what he was called to do. He knew that he spoke nothing on his own initiative. He knew his identity. And when you know your identity, it gives you strength to be able to overcome anything. You're not afraid of anything or anyone because you know who you are. Jesus knew who He was. He said, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Two times He said that. He said, I am the light of the world. He says, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. He says, I am the door of the sheep. He says, I am the door. He said, I am the good shepherd. He says, I am the son of God. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the alpha and the omega. I am who, I am who is, who was, and is to come. I am the almighty. I am the first. I am the last. I am the root. I am the descendant of David. I'm the bright morning star. I'm going to tell you what. He knew who he was. He knew who he was. And because he knew what he was, he did what he did. It said last week, Pastor Alfred said, you do what you do because you are what you are. And he knew who he was, so he was, did what he did. And what did he do? Strictly obedient to the Father.
So the question becomes for me, does Rusty Wills know who he is? Does Deb Giblin, does Carl, does, does Ted, does Linda, does Floyd, does Chris, do all of us, do we know who we are? And more importantly, do we know whose we are? Because whose we are identifies who we are. And the closer you get to who he is, the more you'll understand who you are. Because otherwise you let the world dictate who you are. Doug picked out the song today. God led Doug to pick out the song, You Are the Holy of Holies. I had not talked to Doug about anything. He, God used him to pick that song out. And lo and behold, we looked at Isaiah 6 today. That's only God. But in the midst of that, in that story, we see Isaiah sees King Uzziah sitting on a throne. And the train of the robes fills the sanctuary. And we see the seraphs are flying and stood above him. And they, they're flying with six wings. Two are flying, two covered his eyes, two covered his feet, and he's crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord host. The whole earth is full of his glory. And in the midst of Isaiah seeing all this, he sees the threshold trembling as the omnipotent presence of God, the holiness of God, the total other of God is permeating through his vision. And it says when he sees this and he hears the voice of him who called out and <coughs> the temple is being filled with smoke and as he's seeing this, he cries out, Woe am I, for I am ruined. He said, I am a man who seen eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And he recognized uh, the people among me are ruined. I mean, we're nothing is what he's saying. I am nothing. I am nothing. He identifies that about himself. This is a guy who is on the court of, of the king. This is a guy who had a high position. This guy is a guy who, who had some special power and anointing. But after he saw the vision of God, all he could look at himself and says, Woe is me. I've seen the almighty God. What does God do? The seraph grabs a burning coal, takes it from the altar, and puts it on his lips. And he says, Behold, has, this has touched your lips and your iniquities taken away. Your sins are forgiven. Then the Lord said, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? He goes, I'll go, I'll go, send me, send me. What's the point of all this? Folks, here's the point, and it's a very strong point. The point is, Isaiah knew who he was in his flesh. He understood there was nothing good about his flesh. He saw the magnificence of God, and he recognized God and God alone, and he was overwhelmed by that truth. And he recognized, he looked into his soul. The permeation, when you're in the revelation of God, you're going to see things about yourself. Because unless you're in the revelation of God, it's going to be hard to see much because you're going to think you're okay. You're going to compare yourself to the culture. But if you really have the presence of God and you're looking at God through the Word, that's the reason I'm giving you stuff, God. As I'm, guys, I'm giving you stuff. And what he said, that, Isaiah, that Romans 6 thing I sent out this week, read it, put your name there. It's transformational when you start putting your name before that stuff because it'll make it such a significant difference in your walk with God you understand who he is and who you're not but then you understand who you are because as you take this word oh god i am nothing i'm nothing i'm nothing but see that's how we are before the cross when you came to the when we recognize we're nothing before the cross nothing 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 jesus took every one of our sin because of our nothingness when we understand how much we need christ well, how much we need the gospel without the gospel i've got nothing but in the gospel i have everything and so I take the gospel and I recognize, God, you gave me life. You died for me. You put that burning coals on my lips of my heart. And you touched me and you transformed me by grace and grace alone. That's who I am now. But in the midst of that who I am now, I say, I send me, send me, send me. But the reality is I always need to be, stay focused on what I was in the sense of how he saved me, what he did on that cross for me, so I can know who I am now, that I'm the light of the world, I'm the salt of the earth. I'm holy and beloved by Him. See, guys, this is, this is so rich. This is so rich. 
a quote you can take to the bank, the deeper revelation you have of God, the closer you'll get to God. The deeper the revelation you have of God, the closer you'll get to God. And the more you understand who you are, your identity, now you're going to feel the joy of, of send me, send me. I will go, I will go, because you are with me. That's my identity. You are with me. Carl, when you go to work and you're working those seven-day shifts, guess what? God, you're with me. I'm taking you into this place. He said, go to work today, Carl. Go to work today, Carl. Go to work today. But as you get in the Word and you begin declaring who you are in Him, you take that Isaiah 6. You begin to read that. Put your name in there. And you take that and you understand, sin no longer is master over me. Carl, you are so precious to me. Oh, And you begin to declare that because that's Jesus speaking to you. It changes everything. And you become a light in that place. Instead of going with the guys are saying and they're talking about the girls and they're wah, 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 and all that. No, no, no. I'm, a, I'm, I'm walking holy. And they're going to be drawn to Christ through you. See, that's how this works. This is how this works. What God showed me, I get a load of this. This is a word that God gave me. And you can put your name in all this. I'm an intermediator between God and man. Jesus is the intermediator, but when I'm in him, I become that intermediator in his, set, in his place. That's the reason he sent the Holy Spirit in this world. He sent the Holy Spirit to us. He calls you, us to the church. He said, if you have faith in me, you'll do the same things I was doing. Isn't that what we just sang? Why is that? Because I'm the intermediator for him. I'm his hands, his feet, his mouth. So what begins to happen when I begin to understand? I'm the intermediator between God and people. And when I'm connected with God, I can be that intermediator. I can walk like that intermediator because He's in me. And I can use, and God can use me to change people's lives. And that intermediator begins in prayer. It all starts in prayer. As you start praying for our kids and our loved ones and everybody else, we start praying, we're praying, we're praying. We're that intermediator. When you go to a store, you're that intermediator. If you see yourself this way, I'm the one who's bringing Christ into this place. Not arrogantly, I'm not saying that at all, because you don't go arrogantly. But you go, oh God, thank you. Use me, send me, send me, send me. That's how we're to go. Oh, man. And when that begins to happen, let me just tell you a story yesterday happened to me. Somebody said to me, come pick me up at 9 o'clock and I'll, I'll fix your motorcycle because I need to fix my motorcycle. I've got to get my motorcycle running. I've got to sell it because I can't ride it anymore. If I fall down, I'm in bad shape. Okay. So I've got to get rid of it. So I called this one guy. Come over. He comes it over. We couldn't get it started. We did a couple of things. Uh, but he says, another guy came and picked him up. He says, I'll be back in an hour and a half. Meanwhile, in that hour and a half, I had a phone call from my grandkids saying, hey, do you want to go bowling? I can't. I'm waiting for this guy. So I'm calling this guy, I'm calling this guy, no answer. Finally, 4.15, I get a little text saying, hey, uh, I'll be over a little bit later. So Linda's stay off to work, and I'm going, okay. So I'm, I'm heading that house, and I'm just kind of resting. And he said, to come, he didn't come, he didn't come. Finally, at 7.30, he calls me. He says, I'm not coming over. On. Tit. I just wanted to go over and throttle him in my flesh. I sat in this place waiting for you. And you didn't have the courtesy to call me. You couldn't have texted me and says, I'm not coming, I can't get there. It's okay, I don't care. If you can't come, that's fine. Just let me know. So I'm ticked. Now I just got done praying Romans 6. I prayed a couple others. Because during that time, I'm, I'm going through some of this stuff, okay? I'm having Jesus look at me and speaking these words to me. Love your neighbor as yourself. Give mercy as I've given you mercy. <laughs> I'd even cook dinner. Yeah. <laughs> I had some soup I'd... I'd, I'd frozen a while back, and I took it out, and a big pot of it, added some different stuff to it. Man, it was really good. I mean, it was really good. So, man, I'm, I'm, 
I'm going, man, this will be great. I had some things I was going to share with this guy, boom, boom, boom. As far as food, I mean, I had this whole entree. And, you know, I said, God said, heat burning coals upon his head. What that means is, go love him. So those little salads, you guys have Chick-fil-A, you know, those containers that lemon you eat, okay? I filled three of those up, put it on the top. I took a couple of the canned things I was going to send over to him. I drove over, praying the whole time. God, give me love, give me love, give me mercy, give me mercy, God. I'm to be your ambassador to him. I am to be your intermediator. And I'm praying for him because I'm praying for him because of the situation he has with, with stuff going on in his life. But I'm praying for him because how could somebody be so rude to not to have the care to even text somebody? How could you be so rude? God, what's in his heart that keeps him from being doing the right thing? He doesn't know Jesus. It comes down to that. Dogs are going to do what dogs do. So I'm praying, dear God, dear God, dear God. So I got there and I hugged him. Wow. Now I'm not saying that's easy. When you see Jesus looking dead, show mercy. As I gave you mercy. I sent you, Rusty. I sent you, Deb. Because you're to stand in the gap for so and so. You see, what are there? 14 of us here? Not many people. But you know something? As we capture this heart of this word today, God's going to change us and change those around us. Because we're going to be that intermediator who stands in the gap. Because that's who I am. I am. Because he sent me. My identity is, you are with me. And I'll be honest, you know, just even this morning, I just happened to come in here today and see how many people were here and people going to other churches today and this and that and everything else. I'm going, ah! Oh. <sighs> Dear God, forgive me. It's just, God is so gracious that what he wants us to do He's going, to have, he's going to strip us so you're utterly helpless in the sense of, God, whatever you want, whatever you desire, I'm going to trust you because you're sovereign. You see, one of the greatest words in Scripture is that God's in charge of all. That's a great word. And no matter what's happening around me, he knows what's going on, and he's allowed it to happen, whatever it might be. Can I live with that truth? This morning, I was supposed to go pick somebody up. Made arrangements earlier in the week. I'm texting him, calling him, no answer. <sighs> You're sovereign. I have to trust you. So what happens if you and I and the 14 of us get to that place? We just have to trust you. Can't trust ourselves.
I'm opening up. What are your thoughts? What's God shown you? I call. That's right. He has to do it. That's right. Um, Timothy, you've given us so much this morning. one who knows the right thing to do, the good thing to do, mm-hmm. and does not do it, to him it is sin. Mm-hmm. And it's basically what you did with the story yesterday of yeah. with the right thing, the good thing that God would have done to show mercy. So it's just as we encounter situations mm-hmm. and circumstances in our lives, how can we apply that word, remember who we are. I'm being sent. I'm being sent. I'm being sent. Because I'm being sent not by my own efforts, but by him. That's who I am. And it may not be literally going somewhere, but you can have that mindset and attitude (coughs) wherever you are to reflect God's heart. Any other? We're not throw our pigs to our, our, our what our corn to swine or what was that verse? I'm not throw my pearls. pearls to swine. Pearls to swine. We're not to throw our pearls to swine, but at the same time we're called to pray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah, no. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes you, you just wait till God tells you to go do that. You know. And yeah, you're right. You're right. But yeah, yeah. Good thought. Yes, Linda. Just in the midst of that devotion. Because our attitude is go, yeah. I'm going to change them right now. Yeah. And they don't always receive or what we would say to right. people in the flesh. Right. And like God said. Amen. Well, my friend on the communion says he's going to change. Yeah. And then I saw it at home that day because he was 
wasn't my fault, and it was good because I realized, you know, friends get different things. That's right. Call to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Anyone else? Amen. Amen. <coughs> Let's pray. God, I thank you so much that you are showing us some very rich things here. Father God, you're showing us who you are and who we are in you. God, our identity is you send us. You live in us. You walk amongst us. Our identity. What a precious identity you've given us. I ask God that you forgive me, forgive us. When we think we're something that we're not. It's only you, God. God, there's a lost world out there, and it's, it's, it seems to be getting more lost every day. And God, the only hope is your church. God, would you put that assignment on each one of us? Take away all the facade that we wear. Help us, God, to be that intermediator. The only way we can intermediate is being so close to you. In the name of Jesus, we tear down all those false gods that we have. In the name of Jesus, we come against the false gods of pride and ego and self and worldly possessions. And we come against the spiritual realm that's enticing us into the television and the computers, and we rest there all day long, and the busyness, God. Help us to tear those down like Gideon tore down those walls, those, those uh, Baal. It's only after that, God, that, that you did the powerful work of destroying the Midianites. Oh, God, what's in our life that needs to be torn down? What's in our life, Lord, that needs to be destroyed? What's keeping me from walking one with you? What's keeping me from having these, these time with you every day and throughout the day and just resting and reading your word and, and taking the tools that you've given us here? I'm asking Father in Jesus' name. We give you those, those idols and say, take them down. And give us a thirst and hunger to know our true identity. I'm with you. That's what you said. I'm with you. That's our identity. You're with me. In the midst of our struggles, our worry, our battle with the flesh, Lord, as Linda read out of James, let us always do the right thing. When we have that battle with the flesh where we want to knock somebody over the head, God, stop us. When we want to verbally accost them, stop us. I thank you, Lord. I pray that each one of us here have such a passion, such a heart for you. I pray, Lord, that you give us that yearning to see you like Isaiah saw you. And I pray, God, we have those revelation that will literally transform our lives and our heart.
God, we each have neighbors and loved ones, family members who don't know you. They say they, 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 they know about you, God, but do they know you? Their lifestyle shows it. God, we pray salvation for them. We pray, God, you draw them unto Christ. Oh, God, open the door. Use us as, as people on the face before you. Teach us, God, to turn off the radio when we're in the car and pray. Pray for the guy driving next to me, but for that shop owner, for that house, for the people in that house. Give us that kind of understanding, God. And just praying over them. So, Lord, we thank you for the joy that you give us, that, that desire that we want to serve. I thank you for that joy that you gave Isaiah. Send me, send me, send me. When he knew he was fully forgiven, when he knew that he was fully cleansed. Lord, when we know that we're fully cleansed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death and resurrection, when we know that we have been made free, set free, we're no longer identified with the world, we're now with you, God, and we just say, send me, send me. Give us that such powerful joy, God. That, God, that we are your hands, your feet, your mouth. So I want to thank you, God, for what you're doing here. God, we... We look forward to, Lord, when you've given us a new building, a new place to be. We look forward to when the place is filled with people, God, but, God, people who are on fire who want to grow in you. So we thank you, dear Jesus. And I pray all this in Jesus' name.